being more forgetful of my youthfulness. Be youthfulness. Love you, children. I love those little kids. A couple of them made me the cutest little homemade gift for our uh, Christmas uh, carol and candle service that we had. And, huh? No, but it just said, uh, we love you, Pastor. You're the best. And those gifts from the children, they just, uh, I'd rather take that than a million dollars. Well, maybe not. A no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But they are priceless. They really are. They really, really are priceless. Well, let's pray over the Word of God tonight. We have a teaching on Hanukkah. Some of you, this may be old hat. Some of you, it may be new hat, new stuff. Either way, may it. Father, may your Word tonight enlighten our hearts, awaken our spirits, alive in our souls. Father, we speak not to the flesh of man, but to the spirit of man. The flesh profits nothing, but the Spirit breathes life. Come, precious Holy Spirit, breathe life on your word. Breathe life on all that we say and all that we do tonight. Precious Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, the wind of God, blow in this place afresh. Blow afresh in our life. Renew, rekindle, refire, and reflame us. In the name of Yeshua. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. How many of you are old enough to remember the original Top Gun with Tom Cruise? And you know, Top Gun number two or three or 15 or whatever it is. Number two, all right, it's coming out. And uh, Tom Cruise, you know, it's like 20 years later and he's still a captain. He should be a general by this time or something. But one of the famous lines that uh, I don't memorize much stuff aside from Scripture, but a famous line of that first movie that I'll never forget was he and Goose were walking to the uh, uh, airplanes, and they said, time to kick the tires and light the fires. And I was getting ready this uh, evening for service, and you know, I came up, I told Josh, I came up with this great little saying, time to kick the tires and light the Hanukkah fires. Amen. Amen. I just heard the Holy Spirit saying it's time to encourage people to recommit, rededicate, and to allow Him to live in us. Listen, guys, we get worn out in this life. This life, this life uh, can 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 bear you down. It's like this thumb that just grinds you in. That's why we need fellowship all the time. Someone say Amen. It's not because we're trying to build a cathedral. It's because we need each other. If there were no facility here, we still need each other. Amen? I was so excited. You know, we had our service Tuesday night. Normally, we have Wednesday service. So I, I haven't been into the office. I hadn't seen anybody until Friday night. So I was like walking in. I was like, oh, I miss you all so much. And they're like, huh, why? Because <laughs> we need each other. Amen? And you're used to seeing people all the time. Anyway, all right, let's get started here. So uh, let me grab my little lighter over here. I'm going to teach some of y'all something. Some of y'all already know this. Maybe Holy Spirit will speak something fresh and new to your heart. At this time, uh, after the blessing, we're going to light the Shamus candle. The Shamus candle is the middle candle. This menorah, if you notice, it has eight candle holders and a center candle holder that's lifted up higher than the rest. This menorah is different than that menorah. This is called a Hanukkah. Everybody say Hanukkah. Hanukkah. It's a special menorah that's only used at Hanukkah. And it has eight candle places, which is symbolic of the eight days of the oil burning that you're going to learn about tonight for some of you. And the center one is called the shamus. The shamus candle is called the servant candle. All other candles each night get lit off of the shamus candle. If there is no shamus candle, no servant candle, none of the other candles can ignite. I always try to teach you guys and the Sunday morning guys, especially Sunday school, what's the picture? 
What's the picture? Who is the picture of he who is higher and lifted up, higher than the rest of us? Everybody say Yeshua. And whose fire are we ignited with? Our own? No, I don't know about you, but there's nothing good in me save Him. Amen? So that means that I've got to be ignited. Whoops. I dropped the Shamus holder. I've got to be ignited by Him. Everybody say by Him. Too many believers are trying to ignite themselves. It's called willpower. Force of will. They wake up. Oh, I'm just determined today is going to be a better day. You can't determine anything. You need to submit your life to Him. First thing in the morning you do is you take your little life. This is your life. Hey, I'm off my notes, but y'all follow me. We're going to play with candles. This is your life. This is the Shamus life. His life is always lit. His candle never dies. You've got to take your little candle, submit it to his candle, come over and allow him to light your candle. That's what prayer, that's what devotion, that's what time spent in the Word of God does every day. Amen? Then you're lit. And you can go off to work, you can go off to the market, you can go do your things. And if it starts to go out because the world's blowing a bad wind at you, then you've got to humble yourself. Lord, reignite me. Boom, He's there all day, every day. He's there to rekindle you and refire you. Amen? I love that. I think we'll just play with candles tonight. So, let me ask you this. If that's the case, then why is it that we know His flame's lit, and here's us, we wake up in the morning, our flame's not lit, and we're just going about our day, doing our thing. Man, I feel so terrible. <laughs> then we're upside down. And Lord's like, hello, I'm the Shamus candle right here. All you got to do is come see me and be ignited. But we're too busy. Too busy. Too much stuff to do. Everybody say stuff. This needs to be the year of less stuff in your life. Amen. Stuff will destroy your spirit and will destroy your soul. Amen. And you see you're still moving, still going. You just got to calm yourself down, humble yourself, catch fire. Amen. All right, we can eat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Where's my clicker? All right. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kedeshanu b'mitzvah tov v'tzivanu l'halak ner shel Hanukkah. Amen. Blessed are you, Heavenly Father, King of the universe, who has set us apart by your word and spirit and allowed us to light the lights of Hanukkah. And everyone said... He's always lit. You don't get lit until you get with Him. Amen? In the first night of Hanukkah? Second night? Third night? Fourth night? Fifth night? And tonight is the sixth night of Hanukkah. And the servant candle goes back in the folder, high and lifted up above the rest from which all other candles Amen. Prayer of blessing for the miracle of Yeshua. Prayer of blessing and gratitude that sustains us to reach the season of joy. Father, we do pray a prayer of blessing and gratitude, Father. So thankful, Lord, to have reached another year of dedication, another year, Father, coming to an end and coming to a close. Father, you've done so many incredible miracles in our life, Lord, this year. Help us, Father, to be thankful for our hearts to be filled with gratitude, Lord. Father, so many of your people are so unthankful, not realizing how great a salvation you bestowed upon us, Father. Our hearts tonight, Lord, my heart is overwhelmed with gratitude, Yeshua. Thank you, Father, you've placed your spirit in us, that you saved us, Lord, from eternal death, given to us eternal life, and peace, 
and mercy and grace, not just in the life to come, but in this life. And Lord, we have joy unspeakable, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. In the blessed name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and everyone said, Amen. You know, between the end of the Tanakh, which is in your Bibles called the book of Malachi, everybody say Malachi, and the book of Matthew, if you had your Bible with you on pages, you would see there's only a one-page turn between them. Malachi ends, says New Testament cover page, and then says Matthew. But that one page of separation represents 400 years. Everybody say 400 years. Now, how old's this country? Now, how old's this country that you live in, guys? Anybody know? Come on, guys. Huh? 226 years old. 226 years old is the United States of America. 400 years is almost twice as old as our nation is. And so from Malachi to Matthew is a 400-year span of history and span of time that most believers know nothing or know little about. It's during that 400-year span of history and span of time called the silent period that Heavenly Father did a wonderful miracle of deliverance for Israel and for the temple of God. In 175 B.C., now B.C., year 1 B.C. would be one year before the birth of Messiah, okay? So from the birth of Messiah, counting backwards, everybody understand, is how B.C., before Common Era, B.C.E. actually, is is calculated. So uh, 175 B.C. would be 175 years before the birth of Messiah. Everybody understand the time frame? So we're talking about just past the halfway mark in that 400-year span between Malachi and Matthew. So in 175 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, whose name means the visible God, becomes king. Now, he was a king of the Grecian Syrian realm, empire. And his name literally meant the visible God. How many of you know he was not? Someone say amen. Amen. He was Syrio-Greek. That was the empire at the time. Referenced by writings of his day, he was called the madman. How would you like to be known for thousands of years through history? Here we are, almost 2,175 years later, and we're still talking about him, referenced as madman. He forbids the Jewish people to keep Sabbath. Forbid it against the law. Study or read Torah or to circumcise their sons. Now, listen. As believers, how many of you know the Scripture teaches we're to submit to the civil authority in all things except if they ask you to do something contrary to the Word of God. And so if the government of the Syro-Greek realm were to come in and say, you cannot keep Sabbath, who should you obey, man or God? Well, it depends. Yeah, it's easy to say God, but what if they say, well, if you disobey, you die. Then you have a choice. You have a choice to either die and be martyred, or to leave your home and find somewhere where they can't find you. That's what these folks were facing. So I want you to picture that. Not only were they commanded that they could not keep the Sabbath, they couldn't study or read the Bible, the Torah, the first five books of your Scripture. That's all they had. Most of them was the Torah. And they couldn't study it. They couldn't read it. It was against the law. So not only can you not attend service, you can't keep Sabbath, you can't read the Scripture, but now you can't even circumcise your sons. That's getting personal there, huh? That was part of the covenant God had made with Abraham was that their sons were to be circumcised. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it, am I right? 
Can you imagine? I can't imagine what it was like to live under that kind of heavy-handed rule. And there are people, believers today, living under worse conditions than that. We need to remember them in prayer. North Korea, China. Are you following me? They commanded the temple in Jerusalem to be dedicated and for the worshiping of Zeus. Can you imagine God's holy temple that was built to honor God for the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Holy of Holies, and they are commanded that only Zeus be worshipped in that temple. A mythological Greek god. Can you imagine? Can you imagine coming to your church facility and the government commanded some false god be worshipped from the pulpit? That would be horrible to live under. I'm trying to paint a picture for you of the conditions that Israel was living under at this time. Horrible. Antiochus, the king, erected a statue of Zeus at the temple. Of course, he made the statue to resemble himself. After all, his name was what? Invisible God, small g. So he makes this temple statue with his own likeness and his own image, and he wrecks it and sets it up inside of the temple in the very place where once stood the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of the Spirit of God. How many of you think that's a terrible thing to do? Yet precious Holy Spirit shared with me. So many of his people have erected a statue of themselves in this temple to be worshipped as God. When you try to do things your way rather than and you wonder why you stumble and why you falter. Because we need to get off of the throne of our life, remove that idol of self, and allow His Lordship and Yeshua Messiah to once again rule and reign from this time. That's a word of prophecy. Antiochus entered the temple. Remember now, there's a statue of Zeus in there. Slaughters a pig on the altar. Remember the altar with the four horns where the holy sacrifices were offered? Every day. Every day. Seven days a week. Nine o'clock in the morning, three in the afternoon. On the brazen altar, sacrifice was offered. And there, they killed a pig on the altar. Then they took the blood of that pig and splattered it all over the walls of the Holy of Holies. A priest named Matthias raises an army. God bless, God bless this warrior priest. This would make a great movie. When Matthias dies, his son Judah, Hamakabee, becomes the leader. After three years of fighting, they win. And it's actually a miracle because he raises an army of these Israelites who have been under the oppression of this Grecian army, and they go to battle outnumbered, outmanned, outmatched, but the Spirit of God gives them a victory after victory after victory. And they win. This is history. Judah... Maccabee, orders the temple to be cleansed and rededicated. Can you imagine that cleaning job? They couldn't get the blood off the walls. They literally had to tear the stones out of the walls of the Holy of Holies and replace them. And the stones, they took those and they piled them up in the portico in the temple. Just left a big pile, rock, that had that blood on it. Only enough oil... Now, this isn't in the Scripture. This is not in 1 Maccabees or in 2 Maccabees. This is part of the Jewish uh, uh, law, the oral Torah that's been passed down verbally. Okay, 
I can't say it's the Word of God, but I can just tell you what's been passed down from generation to generation to generation since this time, which is that there is only oil enough found to keep the temple menorahs burning overnight. Now, the temple had a menorah. It was like this menorah right here. It wasn't a Hanukkah because there was no Hanukkah yet. It was a menorah, and this menorah was seven days. Okay? And this menorah, and you can see a, a replica of it um, online, the uh, Temple Institute in Israel, there on the Temple Mount, has built this menorah. And it's made out of pure gold. And it is huge. I mean, really huge. And this menorah was to burn 24-7. So to rededicate the temple, they had to ignite and light the menorah, so it can burn all the time. But only enough oil was found to keep the menorah burning for one night. You see, they couldn't just go and grab any old olive oil. That's what we do because it's the American way. We just grab what's convenient. But it was special oil. Everybody say special oil. Had to be purified. Had to be made according to God's way. God's purpose. God's plan. Very special and it would take eight days to produce this oil. Just the way it was. They only had enough oil for one night. The menorah light in the temple was known as the eternal light. What's the picture of the menorah? Wow. I'm off my notes, but let's get to looking at this for a minute. So we've got seven nights. We have the seven days of creation. Amen? The seventh day of creation was the day that God rested. I tell everybody all the time, I'm not sure they believe me, he didn't rest because he was tired. He's God, he never gets tired. He rested as an example for us to take a day to honor him as holy. Then these seven days also symbolize the seven feasts. You have the first three feasts, which speak of Yeshua, okay? Because you have the Passover, his crucifixion, Feast of Unleavened Bread, his holiness. You have the Feast of First Fruits, his resurrection, on that day. Each of these are on that day. Then the next two candles symbolize the two feasts, which are the feasts that concern themselves with the body of Messiah. You have the day of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Then you, then you have the Feast of Trumpets, which I believe is going to be the sound of the shofars and the removal of the congregation of the Lord from this planet. Then you have the last two feast days, which I believe have to do with the nation of Israel. You have the Day of Atonement, which I believe will be the day that Yeshua returns to planet Earth will be on the Day of Atonement. And then you have the last day, the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, which will be the day that Yeshua establishes his 1,000-year rule and reign and government in this earth on that day. All that from this menorah. Then we're not done. From this menorah, you have the book of Revelation. And you have the first three chapters of Revelation where you have the seven churches. And Yeshua and the King James, it's funny, they, you know, God bless them, they always try to remove everything Jewish. Instead of saying the menorah, they say seven golden candlesticks. But those seven golden candlesticks are the seven pieces of the menorah. And Yeshua walks in the midst of them. And each of the candles represented a different type of congregation. There were seven congregations. Two of them were righteous. Five were not. Amen? All that symbolized in the menorah, the eternal light. Yeshua, the eternal light. So this menorah was lit 24-7 at the temple. So let's get back to our, 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 our notes here and our teaching. So this menorah light's known as the eternal light. Miraculously, the oral Torah says, that miraculously this container of oil that was only supposed to burn for one night burned for eight days. Everybody say eight days which was just enough time to make more consecrated oil. 
How many nights of Hanukkah are there? Eight. Eight days, eight nights. Why? To represent this oil that miraculously lasted until new oil was made. Everybody understand it? Oh, Josh, you're going to have to uh, put the sound on this. I want, I want you guys to hear a song. This song is written by uh, Marty Getz, who was an unbeliever, an unbelieving Jewish man who became a believer in Yeshua. He became a songwriter. And he also wrote songs for Debbie Boone. And so uh, you hear Jim Jones talk about him a lot. But he wrote this Hanukkah song, and it's just beautiful. So I just want you to hear it for just a moment. Just think about your life and his light in your life. Make my life your temple, Lord, at this season star, who pull down every idol I have raised up in my heart on this high. On this feast of dedication, I dedicate myself to you. Take my defiled altar, come and cleanse and come repair. So every time I falter, I can run to meet you there on this Hanukkah, on this feast of dedication, I dedicate myself to you. And with every candle on the menorah that illuminates the night comes a prayer you'd kindle in me, Yeshua, a desire for your fire, for your light. Oh, of my mortal body, a house worthy of your name. Rid me of what's ungodly and every hidden thing of shame on this Hanukkah, on this feast. Dedication, I dedicate myself to you. And with every candle on the menorah that illuminates the night comes my prayer, you. In me, Messiah, a desire yes. for your fire, for your light. Take my supply of oil, not enough to earn all I fear. But oh, how I pray I may one day say A great miracle happened here On this Hanukkah On this feast of dedication I dedicate myself My Yeshua, I dedicate myself. Amen. Amen. 
The Hebrew word Hanukkah means dedication. Everyone say dedication. It is thus named because it celebrates the rededication of the Holy Temple. So every time you say Hanukkah, you're saying dedication. The Hebrew word for that. Everybody say Hanukkah. We need to Hanukkah ourselves, amen? We need to dedicate ourselves daily. We can remember Hanukkah as a fresh dedication to present this body, everybody say this body, as his holy temple, amen? Romans 12, 1 and 3, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So these bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're to present, dedicate them to the Lord as holy and acceptable. And that's the least that's expected of us. Someone say amen. Do not be conformed, shaped, molded to this world. How many of you know the world's trying to do everything it can, mold, shape, and change you? The media is trying to do everything they can to mold and shape these young people. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. How do you renew your mind? By the word of God. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You renew it, you change it, you bring it, and make it clean by getting God's word into your heart each and every day. Once a week at service is not enough. Amen. Every day. Everybody say every day. Amen. How often do we need to allow our little candle to be lit by the serving candle by our Lord is every day. Amen? Every day, every day. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each and every one of us a measure of faith. And I love this. This is the Webster 1828 definition. Now, how many of you know that Daniel Webster was a Christian man? And Webster's today isn't the same as Webster's then. So if you want to look up something, you have to go to the 1828 version if you want to see what was originally written. And Webster's 1828 definition of dedication is the act of consecrating to a divine being or to a sacred use, often with religious solemnities, solemn appropriation as the dedication of Solomon's temple. Dedication. What's he talking about? Hanukkah. And literally, the act of devoting or giving to. So when you devote or give yourself to him, it is an act of dedication. It is an act of Hanukkah. What does the Lord require of us for Hanukkah? He requires us to Hanukkah ourselves to Him, to dedicate ourselves to Him again and again and again and again. How often? And again and again every day. His mercies are new every morning. Amen? John 10, 22 and closing through 25. Then came Hanukkah. Some versions say the Feast of Dedication. It wasn't really a feast. They added that word. Then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem. It was winter. This is the only place in the Bible, in the Scriptures, Hanukkah is mentioned, is the New Covenant. Then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Yeshua is walking around inside the temple area in Solomon's colonnade. So the Judeans surrounded him and said to him, How much longer are you going to keep us in suspense if you are the Messiah? Tell us publicly. Yeshua answered them, I have already told you and you don't trust me. The works I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf. Then in verse 30 and 33 of John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. Once again, the Judeans picked up rocks in order to stone him. Guess what rocks they picked up? Remember I told you that they couldn't clean the blood off the walls of the Holy of Holies? Remember I told you they had to peel those rocks off the walls, the stones off the walls, replace them? And they piled them in the colonnade. Those were the stones, those were the rocks with the pig's blood that they picked up to stone Yeshua. 
Listen to me, guys. Messiah all the time is standing at the door to Let's not defile him. Amen? Let's not take holy things and make them unholy. Let's allow him to work his work. You see the message of Hanukkah tonight? It's a beautiful message. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet.